Welcome back to BioClass Bytes. In this video, we are going to talk about Gregor Mendel's work. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Gregor Mendel is known as the father of genetics. He was a late 19th century scientist and he was an Augustinian friar. His um, work mostly focused on um, trait inheritance or the patterns in the way traits are handed down from parent to offspring. Uh, he observed his um, organisms, specifically the pea plants. That's what he's holding in this, um, in this portrait. And he observed how traits um, have a way of being passed on, and he called that uh, units of inheritance. In his time, uh, people did not know about genes, genes yet or chromosomes yet, so he just called them units or factors of inheritance. So this term, still used today, the units of inheritance um, is, event is eventually what we refer we learn to refer to as the gene. Mendel entered the Augustinian Abbey of St. Thomas in Brno in 1843. Years later, he was sent to University of Vienna to study, returning um, in 1853 as a teacher. Okay? He uh, earned his uh, degree in physics okay, after um, studying. So, uh, so he stayed at the abbey and in his spare time, he bred pea plants with the scientific name Pisum sativo. So this is that, a, a photo of that plant okay, in the monastery garden. So Mendel showed through his work that inheritance of trait follows particular laws, okay? uh, part, follows particular patterns. And um, he was able to come up with different um, explanations on how traits can be passed on. So eventually, you know, he, he wrote a paper, he published his work, and eventually, you know, people took note of his work, and those traits and those um, uh, laws of inheritance were later named after him, uh, no, uh, referring to as Mendel's laws of inheritance. Choosing peace um, as his specimen, um, was actually considered lucky for Mendel because they are perfectly suited for genetic research because they have what they call stable varieties, okay? It means that they have oh, uh, only two uh, variations per um, per feature or for categ per category, okay? So they were just tall and short, smooth and round, green and yellow, white and purple, and actual and terminal um, locations of their flowers. So there's just um, two varieties per, per trait okay, that he was studying about. Um, in his work, no, he noticed that there's something in the pollen, okay, in the pollen of the flowers and the egg um, found in the ovaries okay, of pea plants uh, that according to Mendel determines the height, color, texture, and flower position of the plants. Okay? So this is an illustration of those uh, pea plants, and these are the traits he observed. So Mendel called that something as factor or unit of inheritance, and eventually that factor will be later known as gene. Okay? So in his work, uh, that factor exists by pair. Um, so an individual could be a homozygote. So an individual um, plant can be a homozygote. Homo similar, okay? Similar... Um, forms of that factor, okay? It, so, uh, letters are assigned to it, assigned to that, so, uh, to that factor, so that it will be easier to trace the lineage and inheritance. So, uh, homozygotes ha are represented by uh, letters having the same um, configuration, so both capital letters or both small letters. So, if you're a homozygote, okay, for, the, for, an, for a particular trait, you have similar um, allele expression. Or an individual can be heterozygote, hetero others. So it has one capital and one small letter. Okay? So again, no, the, that factor always exists by pair. One, two, one, two, one, two. And it can look the same in terms of allele of expression, both capital or both small or they could be different, or a heterozygote, one capital, one small letter. By the way, for heterozygotes, the capital letter is always written first. Aside from that, he also discovered that a trait can be dominant or recessive. 
If the trait is dominant, it is usually the ones that it is expressed. The one that you can see. Okay, for example, you can see um, a, a plant having a tall height or you can see a plant having a purple flower. So that's what you see. Uh, or while at an, a recessive trait is considered masked or not, those are the ones that are not expressed or not shown. So in this um, uh, image, you see here seed shape, okay, as a character that Mendel was studying. And there's two varieties of seed shape, wrinkled, this is still for peace, no? Wrinkled or round um, pea plant seed shapes. To learn more about Mendel's work, I recommend that you watch this video from Ted Ed entitled How Mendel's Pea Plants Pea Plants Help Us Understand Genetics. Very good, very informative video. I'll provide the link in the description below. So this was uh, the experimental design uh, by Mendel. So this is how he conducted his experiments. So this is what he did. No? He first he located where the, the pollen can be found. So that's in the anther. Well, the egg of the, the flower is found in the carpel, right? In carpel or the female um, reproductive part of the plant. So in order to ensure that there, there will be no, um, um, no other pollen that will fertilize the, the flower, the purple flower plant, he removed or he cut away the, the anthers, okay? So what remains um, would be just the carpel of the purple flower of that plant. Then he obtained pollen from a plant with a white flower and then transferred that or fertilized the egg of a purple purple flower plant. Okay, remember, he removed the anther of this plant. So there's no way it will be pollinated okay, by, by other pollen except, this, except the ones that he got from a white flower. So he put that, he put the pollen in the carpel, in the uh, stigma of, a purple, of that purple flower and then allowed it to, to be fertilized. Then, um, so uh, of course, uh, fertilization occurs, the uh, seed develops and then uh, when those seeds were planted, they all produce a plant that can only give uh, rise to or, or can only have purple flowers. So that's quite amazing. So imagine it has two parents, a, a plant with purple flower, which, con which bears the egg, and a plant with a white flower, which bear the pollen. But all their offspring, all their offspring have uh, purple flowers. So where did the factor or, or unit of inheritance from the plant with the purple flower went? So he repeated that experiment for hundreds and hundreds of plants, hundreds and hundreds of pea plants, and these are the data he was able to gather. So um, most of the time, okay, most of the time, a particular variety, okay, is expressed more often than the other, okay. So, for example, um, if these are the traits that were crossed. A plant with a pea plant with round seed shape versus a wrinkled seed shape. So, um, more plant, more offspring will show the round uh, seed shape. So that's 5,474 offspring versus 1,850 wrinkled uh, seed shape. Okay, 6,000. Uh, is to 2,000. That's the ratio for or the numbers, okay? For yellow versus green seed color. Uh, for um, actual position, okay, so that's found um, on the sides of the plants, 651 versus 207 for terminal. Those are found on top, terminal position. Um, for um, green pod color, 428, um, and then 152 for yellow pod color. So these are the numbers that he recorded. And when he computed for the ratio, he noticed a trend that out of every four offspring, three of them will have 
that particular trait, dominant, purple, actual, tall, inflated, green, and only one out of four offspring will show the other trait. So if you actually round this off to 98, 296, 299, so that's rounded off to 3, rounded off to 3, 3, 3. So there will always be a 3 is to 1 ratio. Okay? So if you cross two parents of different uh, varieties in his pea plants, three of the expected offspring will show the dominant trait. Okay? while one of the four offspring will show the recessive trait. And that's how we, he determined that this is the dominant trait because they are the ones who appear most often. And this is the recessive trait because this, they are the ones who appeared least. So what was his conclusion? Okay, so what did he discover? What did he found out? Okay. So he said that individual factors, that's what he keep on calling them, individual factors or individual unit or units of inheritance, um, which do not blend, it means that there are only just two, two uh, varieties to choose from, control each trait of a living thing. Okay? These factors will eventually be called um, genes. And if you still remember our lesson on central dogma, no, genes are segments of DNA that can be inherited and they code for a protein which eventually becomes, you know, whatever, whatever function it has in the body. Now, different forms of that gene or factor are called alleles. We've talked about that, homozygous and heterozygous alleles. So, for example, a gene for plant height um, uh, occurs in tall, okay, tall allele, or it can also have a short um, allele. So, those are the forms of the gene. Some alleles can be dominant. Some alleles can be dominant. Some alleles can be recessive. Okay? Now, the effects of the dominant allele are seen even if the trait for, even if the organism carries the recessive allele. Okay? So, we will learn more about this in the loss of inheritance, but this is what he discovered. So, even if, if an organism is carrying one, um, one allele for, for dominant and then another, another allele for recessive, the recessive allele is not expressed or the recessive gene is not expressed. Only the dominant gene or the dominant trait is expressed. The effects of a recessive allele is only seen um, if only, only if a dominant allele is not present in the organism. So this one, I know it's quite um, confusing, but this will be ex um, explained further uh, as we go along. So, so far, these are the things he discovered in his experiment. To read more about Mendel's experiment, you can visit NCBI. Um, so they have here a segment about Mendel's experiment. I'll provide the link in the description below. So um, I've mentioned that what he discovered uh, was eventually made into laws and they were named after him. So let me present the Mendel's laws of in inheritance. So there's three. First, law of segregation. This segregation, so to separate. So this states that two alleles for each characteristic segregate during gamete production. So I hope, you know, uh, when we discover this thoroughly, you will still remember our lesson about meiosis. Next, law of dominance. It states that if a homozygous dominant trait, okay, so a homozygous, a pure, a pure breed, a homozygous dominant trait is cro crossed with a homozygous recessive trait, Okay, so in the case of uh, this, a homozygous dominant trait is crossed with a homo homozygous recessive trait. The recessive trait will be totally masked, okay? Or the recessive trait or recessive gene will not be expressed by the offspring, okay? So we will learn, learn more about it. Then the law of independent assortment states that the inheritance pattern of one trait will not affect the inheritance pattern of another. It means that um, uh, you, you, you inherit uh, traits uh, from the parents, the offspring inherit traits from the parents uh, one at a time. So it's not by bulk. So one for uh, one trait for, I uh, know, one trait for hair color, another trait for, for um, uh, height, another trait for shape of lips. So they are the, the, the expression of the trait is determined individually or okay, independently. So it's, it does not happen 
by bulk that you inherit everything okay if you happen to inherit everything from your father then you're a clone of your father which you know for sexual organisms it rarely happens it only means that those traits of your father are mostly dominant that's why they are the ones that are expressed okay so we will discuss more about that so mendel's findings uh, were described in his essay so he wrote an essay entitled experiments on plant hybridization in 1865 sadly when he published his work when he presented his work they were largely rejected because you know people were not really seeing the application of his work and they were focused mostly on other problems to solve um, though they were not completely unknown to biologists at the time um, his work was seen um, as um, not really a priority even Mendel, Mendel himself did not see the applicable application applicability of his work um, and they were all that they can only be applied to certain species now this is one thing uh, sadly you know that Mendel did not know remember he published his work in 1865 Charles Darwin published his origin of species in 1859 okay Charles Darwin published his work ahead of time okay 1859 and then later 1865 Mendel publishes work about genes. If only Mendel knew about Charles Darwin's work, he will see that his work is actually, uh, Mendel's work is actually very, very important. How? In Charles Darwin's um, natural selection, uh, rem um, so we should, this will be thoroughly discussed okay, uh, in the last unit of the academic year. He said that there's always overproduction in, in a population. There are variations within a population, and then whoever is the uh, variation that is best suited to survive in the environment will be selected by nature, and they will be the one to to pass to reproduce and pass on their traits to their offspring. Um, Darwin, even though he knows that there's variation within a species, he cannot explain yet how that is possible. How he that he he knows he noticed. Darwin noticed that there's variation uh, in, in within a population, but he cannot explain yet. And he cannot, he does not know yet how inheritance happen. He just know that those who survive are the ones who reproduce and then they're passed on their traits. So this is where Mendel's work uh, comes in. Because in his work, he was able to explain how there are variations within a population, that they are homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, heterozygous organisms, and that traits, uh, as mentioned in the loss of inheritance, are, are passed on to the offspring following the loss of independent assortment and the loss of domin uh, loss of domin law of dominance. So this is the application of Mendel's work. And actually, if we if, um, we will discuss this in evolution, that the modern synthesis theory of evolution is actually a merger between natural selection by Charles Darwin and Mendel's um, loss of inheritance so this is uh, this is where his um work was actually applied okay and so that's actually quite a big thing because he helped explain how living things um, eventually evolved over time though it happened way after his time so in his research in his in his uh, paper the words chromosomes or, or genes are nowhere to be found he just calls them he just called them factors or units of inheritance and the role of these things in relation to inheritance and heredity have not yet, not yet discovered during this time. However, what makes his contribution so impressive is that despite not knowing about chromosomes or genes, he was able to actually come up or describe the basic patterns of inheritance based on his experiment. Right? Way before we had the telescope, a superior telescope to actually see chromosomes or to actually discover uh, genes. So... That was great, and that's what science, what science, a uh, great science actually is. A great theory um, actually predicts uh, possible um, outcomes of uh, um, or possible application of, of one's work, even if it's not yet available during the time that it was written. So same thing with with uh, Darwin. Okay, he he really did not know yet about transitional fossils. He really did not know yet about genes. So, but he. However, in his work, he was able to, to predict that variations and inheritance within a population are all possible. So, and it was, um, it was supported by 
the work uh, that Mendel did. So Mendel published his paper in 1865. So these are the, um, the genetic discoveries um, after him. So 1869, Mencher discovered a weak acid in the nuclei of white blood cells. Eventually, that's, that became known as the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. 1880, Fleming and others um, elucidated chromosome distribution during cell division. I hope you still remember uh, the stages of cell division, stages of my, mitosis. Okay, that was one of our previous lessons. Uh, 1889, De Vries uh, sp postulated that inheritance of specific traits comes in particles, naming those pan genes, which eventually shortened to genes. 1910, Morgan showed that genes reside in the chromosomes. 1913, Stur Sturtevant made the first genetic map of a chromosome. So imagine the progress that happened after Mendel. 1931, crossing over was identified as the cause of genetic recombination in meiosis. I hope you still remember this. 1930, Brachet was able to show that the DNA is found in the chromosomes and that RNA is present in the cytoplasm of all cells. So I hope you still remember our lesson on central dogma of molecular biology. 1940, Tatum and Beadle showed that genes code for proteins, still part of our lesson on central dogma. The 1944 Theodore Avery, Macleod, and McCarthy isolated DNA and determined it as, ge as the genetic material of living cells. In 1953, Watson and Crick resolved the DNA structure and discovered that, they were, that DNA actually has a double helix structure. 1956, Theo and Levan established the correct chromosome number of humans to be 46. 1958, Mesensol Stahl, in, his, in their experiment, um, demonstrated that DNA is semi-conservatively and uh, con semi-conservatively replicated. I hope you still remember this. 1964, Temin showed using RNA viruses that the redirection of DNA to RNA transcription can be reversed. And the rest of uh, history of genetics can actually be found here, the history of DNA timeline. Um, you can check this out. I'll provide the link in the description below. And this one is the medical ge genetics overview. So you can actually uh, pause the video and look at it closely, or you can uh, visit the online library and see the PDF about it. So Mendel is somewhere here. So 1859. Okay. Charles Darwin published his work on origin of species. 1865, Gregor Mendel presents his principles of heredity. Okay. And then now, so all of those things that I've just talked about. <clears throat> so now uh, we are here. Uh, we are now in the era of CRISPR. We are now altering genes, somatic. Some have even tried altering gametic um, cells. So everything, everything that we have... Um, we have, um, we are actually, we actually know about genes and genetics and heredity. All can be traced back to Mendel's work in 1865. Now, here are some terms uh, that we will continuously use all throughout the rest of the of the series. Okay, the rest of the video and the rest of the series. So DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, D. N A. Okay, so this is a double-stranded molecule, which is known as the uh, as the which carries the genetic information of living organisms. Okay, so it this is the double helix uh, representation structure. So um, uh, so you have here the bases in the middle, and we all know that they are paired. So adenine is paired with thymine, and cytosine is paired with guanine. It also has a sugar phosphate backbone. It's called DNA, deoxyribo, because it is missing one oxygen molecule, um, molecule okay, compared to RNA. So, uh, human genome has 3 billion pairs of bases and all that. Gene is the functional and physical unit of heredity. This is passed on from parent to offspring. They are found in the chromosomes or they are actually segments of DNA that code for a pro specific protein. So the number of human genes is around 2,000 to 25,000 and different genes can vary in length and can to cover thousands of bases. Genome are all the DNA contained in an organism or in a cell. So the, your genome is found in, in the nucleus 
of all the cells in your body. So that's your genome. So again, gene, segments of DNA. DNA are coiled and condensed to form chromosomes, specifically during mitosis and meiosis, and they're found in the nucleus of the cell, of every cell in your body. Okay? So DNA condensed in chromosomes, found in the nucleus, found in the cell, found in every part of your body. So, okay? So every cell in the body has a nucleus. We all know that genes can be passed on from parent to offspring. We call that inheritance. Some genes are active or on, so they are expressed. Others are not. Um, the genes are the ones that tells the cells to become a liver cell or a lung cell. And it's important that every future daughter cells have a copy of the DNA so that they will know what type of cell they will become. So to review about genes and how they function in creating proteins for the body, I recommend that you watch the previous uh, playlist on Central Dogma or you can visit the PDF in the online library. You can also re-watch this video from TED Ed entitled DNA, The Book of You. Uh, this was already recommend, also recommended in the previous um, lesson, but I'll still provide the link in the description below. Same with this video from DNA to Protein, the different processes of central dogma. Again, I'll provide the link in the description below. That ends our video. I hope you learned something new. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and like and share this video. Till next time, goodbye!